Hello, everyone. Welcome to AECNYC Tuesday Night Lecture. We're going to be covering Armenian church history today. Uh, we are in the third part in a three-part series called uh, Armenian Church History. And before we begin, uh, we're going to uh, uh, take a look at an important city that has been um, there for, um, it's still there, uh, and it's a plays a vital role in the narrative of 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 what we know in modern Armenia uh, and in modern Turkey. So Byzantium was the city before Constantine the Great took it, the Roman Emperor, to make it uh, Constantinople. And Constantinople was the New York City for a thousand four hundred years. It, 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 like, it is that important of a city culturally. Uh, it's between Asia, it's between in Europe. It's, it's the only city that has two continents connected to it. Um, it is the hub of political power, uh, the religious uh, um, authority, uh, which would end up becoming Eastern Orthodoxy. And it was a cultural, financial capital. It's, it has, it's a natural, massive port. I remember uh, visiting Istanbul twice. Uh, one time I visited because I was on a cruise ship around the Mediterranean. I had, uh, I had a month. Actually, the, the story is this. I was learning a month in Venice for Armenian studies. And uh, I was supposed to do a month of missionary work in Armenia before I started work in the New York church 10 years ago. And, um, but the Armenian missionary trip got canceled. So I hopped on a cruise ship around the Mediterranean with that money I raised for this missionary trip. So I was like St. Paul going through all these stops on a cruise ship. It was very difficult, I know. Uh, I ended up becoming the love boat chaplain. But anyway, one of the stops, like a third of the boat knew me by the time of the trip, I was evangelizing. So I was a missionary trip. But anyway, um, one of the, stops was Istanbul and if you've ever been on a cruise you kind of do a pre-packaged arrangement where I got on the cruise ship uh, and I wanted to go to the Hag Hagia Sophia. I visited a couple of times this is the first time I visited and they set you up with a local tour guide who was Turkish and I remember uh, him teaching church history in a in a like a deconsent like a he was a uh, he was looking down on the like white tourists thinking they're all Christians. And he was trying to like stump them. Like, you don't even know your Christian history. This is the building that this happened, this happened. And he would actually say false information. Like I would actually correct him about the church history part of, of this important cathedral, uh, Hagia Sophia, which the Holy is the Holy wisdom. And uh, he was shocked to be like, how does this guy know so much on this stuff? And then I went forward to talk to him about the genocide. And I told him I'm Armenian in a Starbucks right outside of the Hagia Sophia. This is probably not the wisest thing to do, but I was just like telling him, look, you, you guys committed genocide on my people. Your, your history is wrong. Um, and he would have these like narratives of, of um, uh, it, we were trying to rebel. Uh, we were fighting in the army. All I had to do was tell my personal story of my, my grandfather being a doctor in the Ottoman empire. He was a doctor for the Ottomans. He was saving Turkish soldiers' lives. Like, all I had to do was tell my story to him and just patiently listen uh, to what he was taught. So he was taught a faulty history. He didn't know Christian history. He didn't know Armenian genocide history. And he's a tour guide for Turkey. I'm saying all this because history matters. The story matters. And um, uh, again, I, I was just trying to poke holes into his logic that he was given. He, he was indoctrinated into this stuff. This is an important city. This is an important church. Um, an Armenian in the ninth century helped rebuild this church. Uh, a lot of the Orthodox churches are shaped after the Hagia Sophia. Um, it is a very beautiful place. It has a lot of history uh, on multiple levels in church history, but also in architectural design. It is, became a museum, then it became a mosque, and it's a mosque right now, I believe. But this used to be Byzantium, uh, a very influential cultural capital of 
a New York City from 330. It's the continuation of the Roman Empire from 330 all the way to the 1453. Um, there was a, the 204 to 2061. Uh, that's when the Venetians and sacked Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade, and uh, it became under Latin rule. Um, but a lot of world history takes place in this city. And I mention all that because how many of you have been to, say, Koreatown or uh, whatever city you're from? There's usually pockets of big ethnic groups there. One of those big ethnic groups throughout this giant city is us, Armenians. <laughs> Armenians are part of the lineages in the emperor, empress system. Just imagine just this cosmopolitan, but like, there's a really strong Armenian presence as a minority cultural group in this very important historic city. It's hard to think this way, but it, think more cosmopolitan, think about more international, and you have this important history of us in this area. So um, things really change. Like we talked about Western Armenia, uh, we talk about the rise and falls, the infighting, the Mongols coming through, um, Eventually, after all the fighting is done, the Ottomans start to take over. And their defining moment is when they take over Constantinople, which becomes Istanbul eventually. That's in 453. So uh, since that moment of the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, they expanded and became one of the biggest empires that had a long reign from uh, the fall to 1922. I don't know if I, that's accurate. Uh, it should be 1433. Oh, the Ottoman Empire was smaller before it took Constantinople. Um, but 1922, um, uh, it grew to this size. And as you see, it eventually takes over what is now Western Armenia, uh, Eastern Turkey. And Armenians are this Christian minority group in Constantinople. They're a minority, but they're a populated group in Western Armenia and what is current Armenia. And we all come from either Istanbul or one of these villages. And I remember another story. Uh, this is why history matters. I was talking to my AP world history teacher in high school. And he was talking about the Ottoman Empire. And he was praising the Ottoman Empire for being a, a, a Muslim empire that was respecting all citizens, regardless of their religious background. He was really pushing this narrative that um, there was like this American equality all of a sudden in the Ottoman Empire, the way he was talking. And I was pretty much like, you got to be kidding me. Have you heard about the Armenian genocide? <laughs> Have you heard about the massacres? Have you realized that we were always second class citizens? And I actually, he really like rethought his curriculum he was given. And I'm a high school kid. I don't know anything, but I'm, I'm like, I just know my story as an Armenian. This doesn't add up. And I remember talking to him about the Janissaries. Janissaries were the Turkish Ottoman elite force. What they did was they would take Christian young boys and turn them into killing machines. So they took young Armenian boys, turned them into killing machines for the empire. That's pretty not fair. That's pretty evil. I would say that that ranks up there as evil. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of talk about this millet system where uh, different ethnic groups and different religious groups had their own self-governing body. And that was true probably towards the latter end of the empire. Um, there was eventually a, an Armenian Protestant Millet system, uh, a Catholic Millet system, an apostolic Millet system, and Jewish and various other subgroups. But things really took a turn for the worse in the, in the 19th century. Nationalism is happening across the country. It's leading to builds ups of wars and World War, um, and then you have the beginning of some of our massacres. You have the Hamadian massacre, you have the, the massacres in Adana. These are all precursors to the genocide. So eventually, this giant empire of Ottoman Turkey is going to just be what is now Turkey at, by the end of the World War I, and we are going to be scapegoated as the reason why it's declining. We are literally the black sheep of why this massive empire is declined and the Ottoman Empire make up a new nationalism based on Islam and secularism 
at our expense, uprooting us from indigenous lands. And that's why we're probably here in New York right now or wherever we're from on the West Coast, East Coast, I mean. You get the idea? Like th this is this crazy history is connected to why we are here. <laughs> and uh, and it, it starts with this empire declining and us being the reason, uh, used as a reason. And they literally uproot us from our indigenous lands and we're, we're, we're forced into exile in the Middle East. Some of us end up in New York. Um, and that's why we, we're remembering our history. History matters. Whether it's an AP history teacher or a Turkish tour guide, we need to know our history. So now let's jump to during this time of the Ottomans, you have our people still being Armenian. Uh, you have uh, a Catholic church movement emerging. Uh, there is debate on when the Armenian Catholics began. Uh, some like to say it started with St. Peter and from the very beginning of the conversion of St. Gregory, there was Ca Armenian Catholics. Probably there was more of a Catholic influence that came later with the Crusaders from France. There was some mingling there. But Armenian Catholics as like their own like leadership and entity really begins with the Miketarists, if, if it's in my opinion. I'm sure there was Armenian Catholics throughout church history giving allegiance to the Pope versus the Catholicos. But um, the Miketarist order are amazing, the origins of it. Uh, you have this guy, Miketar, who wants to start a, a monastic order. The Catholicos is like, I don't know if that's our thing. So he goes to the Catholics and he's eventually given a plot of land in a leper colony. And there's this island that used to be a former leper colony that's currently a monastery where there's Armenian monks. And during that whole uh, part of me growing around the Mediterranean, I got to be at this monastery every Sunday. And I went multiple times. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. It's beautiful. I recommend every Armenian to go there. It has one of the richest libraries. It has a mummy, one of the best preserved mummies. Lord Byron, uh, the, the famous guy who wrote the New Year's Eve song and this intellectual guy, he lived on this island when he, he just lived there and donated a bunch of stuff. There's so many classic books. There's a lot of amazing artwork. And there's monks that like I drink, I mean, that I like I had uh, kebab with after service, played soccer with them. Uh, one of my favorite moments ever was there was the bishop of the Army Apostolic Church visiting from London. Um, the Catholic abbey, abbot, the guy who was in charge, and me as this new guy who was about to become the New York City pastor, we all sat at the head of the table after one service, and there was just this ecumenical Armenian Christian fellowship. And that's really the heart of hopefully what I want to talk about. Like that spirit is really phenomenal. One of my favorite my memories is that just sitting with this abbot and this archbishop while I'm this new seminarian, and, and they brought me to the table to eat with them in the front. Um, so anyway. That order was started in the 1700s. 701 is probably the accurate date. And he creates this monastic order that brings a, an intellectual cultural renaissance because they utilize the printing press. They, have, they establish a monastery in Venice and also in Vienna, which is another important city. And you could visit it and you could see these printing press and they started public, publicizing Western Armenian pamphlets, uh, the Psalms, uh, they're being Martin Luther 200 years later. They're, they're really pumping out material for people to, to, to read. And a lot of it is Christian material. Um, and they actually set the, the backdrop for the evangelical movement that we are part of. And they happen to be Catholic. And their liturgy, if you go to an Armenian Catholic church, it's like the same thing almost. It feels like you're an Orthodox church. It's just their, their allegiance is to the Pope. Um, so yeah, so again, there's a small population of Armenian Catholics, just like there's a smaller population of Armenian Protestants. Um, but they, this monastic order deserves to be part of our, our history because not only do they create a Catholic movement, it, it, it benefits all of Christian, Armenian Christians, whether they're apostolic, whether they're future Protestants. The, the stuff they're doing is, is creating intellectual, spiritual life back into the, the life of the people. And it's just, just the monks being like, hey, let, let's use the printing press. Let's Let's preserve our history. Let, let's, let's write and replicate and, and pump out material. Um, you could visit the, both monasteries in Venice and also in Vienna. The people in Vienna are not as friendly, though. <laughs> I, 
I just, I, but, but they're great spots to visit. Um, so let's talk about our movement. Our movement officially starts in 1846 in um, Istanbul. You have 40 men and women gather to bring reform. And the reform is get the scriptures in the people's hands in a language they can understand. Let's stop praying to saints because that's bad. <laughs> and I, I still say that's really bad. Don't do that. Um, and like, let's just modernize. It wasn't like that. Ra it wasn't too radical in, in, in like we, they were revolting against indulgences like Martin Luther did 500 years ago. It, what, there wasn't like extreme corruption. It just like, let's just get the Bible and the vernacular. And this Armenian led movement, I want to stress this because I think people think that the missionaries really made the Armenian evangelical movement. They supported the movement, but it really was from the Armenian clergy who, who were beginning to have these reform, reformist ideas who were educated, who were reading the Bible for themselves. They're realizing some, some things don't add up. Uh, maybe we should stop praying to the dead, praying to saints. Maybe we should uh, have everyone know the Bible. That's a good thing. Going back to that evangelical spirit of St. Mesrop and Sahak, um, they were recapturing that moment and using modern translations, the printing press, to get the word out. Uh, we eventually got excommunicated for our reforms, and we created our own millet system. We we're talking about earlier in the Ottoman Empire, about five years after this. And then many revival breaks out in the Ottoman Empire. The evangelical movement lights a quick fire in a blaze from 1846 to 1915 before the genocide. To put it in perspective, this movement is 175 years ago. Our church is 125 years old. So within 50 years of this movement, we already have a church in New York, part of this movement. Phenomenal. That's, this is the legacy we're connected to. So in Turkey, before the genocide, there was 137 churches, 82 ordained reverend ministers, 97 lay leader licensed ministers, 270 schools, 369 primary schools, 44 high schools, eight colleges, a college for women, and five seminaries, five seminaries. Revival is breaking out before the genocide. This intellectual, uh, religious fervor begins to grow. And yes, the missionaries supported us, but they, they, they participated, they helped translate it, and there's, there's various missionaries that did great stuff. Uh, they're the ones who eventually are the eyewitnesses to the genocide. They're the ones who provide Western education into some of this. But it is an Armenian-led movement. And the missionaries were coming from America to the Ottoman Empire to convert the Muslim Turks, but they realized that was a lot harder. So they, they ended up helping us realizing that we have a better understanding of their culture and how to convert them. So that they focus on the Armenian group. So this is the Armenian evangelical movement we're connected to. Um, the Lazarus Catholic, St. Lazarus Catholic movement with the Mikatars helped set the stage. Uh, you have educated um, Armenians going studying in America and Yale. There's a bunch of pastors we have who went, were studying in Yale before, like during this period, um, in France, in various parts of, of, of the world. Um, there's this education that's just there. And our legacy uh, in the Armenian evangelical world, our, in the Armenian greater world, is we've always had this emphasis on education and getting the scripture back into people's hands. That's our legacy um, and, and in many ways, we've succeeded in bringing reform, um, like some of the, the things that the reformers were fighting for, like people have the Bible now, all Armenians have the Bible. Um, uh, but again, there's a lot of cultural layer Armenian Christianity. We want Christ-centered, you're a Christian and you happen to be Armenian Christianity. So they did stress you have to have this personal encounter. And if you read the, the documents, um, you can, you, you read senses of revivalistic things breaking out in different cities. Uh, and it's cool to read it. Like people are just filling the churches. There's no pews. They're sitting on carpets. Um, many of us have a spiritual lineage to this movement some way. Um, and those who, who are no longer with us, 
they were martyrs to be with the Lord. Um, it, it, a lot of amazing Christian people, whether they're Catholic, Orthodox, or Apostolic, would end up dying during our genocide. And uh, look at look at this map. I mean, we were scattered throughout Western Armenia. I don't know how accurate this is, but it does give a sense of how extreme it is, right? Like this whole region gets uprooted. You could visit the churches, you could visit the monasteries, you could dig up the bones um, if, if, if they let us excavate a bit more. I mean, there's, this is all the proof you need. It wasn't just killing people, it was uprooting our history. And we can't, we can't like stop telling our history, otherwise they'll be successful in what they were trying to do. We were scapegoated as, as they're losing World War I. Um, a new Turkish nationalism is literally founded on our blood. Um, the genocide. And we, we celebrate on April 24th, 1915, because that's when it began. It was a systematic arresting and killing of our leaders. And then from the leaders to the men, and then met a lot of women and uh, children were forced on these death marches to leave the area, and many of them died on the way. Uh, many of us are survivors of, uh, from, from some aspect of this, and we probably all have stories to share um, because we're directly connected to this evil. So the genocide really puts an end to the, the, this movement, but it also spreads us out. Um, Armenians become a very diaspora people even more because of this. That's why we have big communities in Lebanon and, and Syria. But this Lebanese civil war, the current crisis economically in Lebanon, the Syrian civil war, there's been an emptying out of our population there recently. Some of that population is going back to Armenia, which is cool because it's bringing Western Armenian into an Eastern Armenian culture. The food's getting better. I, I'll, I'll be blunt with that. Western Armenian food is superior than to Eastern Armenian food. Um, and uh, But there's this more of a diverse intermingling that's happening. Um, so anyway, the genocide is evil. And we still have to fight until there's recognition in Turkey. Um, and the beginning of that movement is starting, but it's going to take a while but we have to be persistent. At least we were successful in America. Um, thank you, Joe Biden. Um, Bruce's dad uh, was a lobbyist uh, and would take the train with Joe Biden. So I think if there was one person connected to convincing Joe Biden, it's, it's Set Momjan, who's Bruce's dad, who's right here. So um, that's pretty cool connection right here in this uh, chat. Um, so let's move on. So... Armenia has independence for two years um, uh, after World War I. There's this battle they win. They were able to preserve this little piece of land. We have our tricolor flag, uh, the, the tricolor flag. Um, but then we become a, a satellite of the USSR. Um, so we went from Muslim persecution to atheistic indoctrination like and then all those who survived were just surviving so russia like i mean i was talking to my good friend who well, i've been arming a few times uh but one guy who is an older guy he used to build rockets um for the soviet union he was he was he built rockets for the ussr and I remember asking him, what was, what was life like during the Soviet Union? And he'd be like, it's like chicken and farm, he said. Um, you have food, but like nothing really happens. OK. <laughs> um, there's, this, there's this really pessimistic mindset with the USSR. Like a lot of older Armenians are very pessimistic. They, don't, they can't be hopeful. There's no like American dream spirit inside of and like in that older generation. Of course, there's exceptions. But it really like diminished the religiousness of the Armenians. But even then, like Armenians are so Christian that like the moment the USSR falls, like you have the church really getting back on its feet and it's still getting back on its feet. And you have various like Protestant movements happening that are not connected to the Armenian evangelical movement doing a lot of interesting things right now in Armenia. Um, so, so the, the Ottoman 
I mean, the, the USSR uh, empire falls and uh, you have religious fervor. I would say Armenia is probably the, one of the most Christian countries right now. Um, like from my experience talking to people in the sense that like people may be, like will believe in God and have some sense of Jesus. They might not have like a saving faith in Jesus, but there's a Christianness there that I feel like is much higher than it is here. <laughs> um and uh it, it's deep rooted like even they may not know the bible that well some people but they, there's at least that that there's like that simple faith that's there i'm trying i'm trying to get at that armenian spirit um and the soviet union was unsuccessful in, in crushing the christianity from us the genocide was unsuccessful in in crushing the the the, the this christian spirit from us these empires are gone um they, i mean they're still around in different forms but but we have this perseverance that goes all the way back to what we talked about in the first talk. So modern day Armenia uh, is interesting. Majority are apostolic. We have a minority Ar Ar Armenian Protestant group. It's hard to really number us because being Protestant, we, we're scattered and it's hard to really know the numbers. Uh, and there's a small Catholic group as well. And another shout out to the Catholics is they have the sisters, um, a, a monastic, a, a, um, a group of nuns who, who do a lot of work with schools, especially middle schools, and they work in orphanages too. Um, so anyway, now the, the conversation of why is there a prelacy and diocese, I don't know the exact details of it, but uh, pretty much there was like, can we trust the Katholikos who's an Etchmiadzin who is under Soviet rule? Um, and, and there was a back and forth with that. And you had um, the, the Glikia, um, Katkolikos, and a Katkolikos seat and Um So, but the a moment of a divide happened actually in New York City of all places, where this Archbishop Leon Turian uh, was killed during a Badrak service on Christmas Eve, on American Christmas Eve. Uh, four people from the, the, the Tashnak group came and stabbed him. Uh, in the middle of a church service in New York City. Um, and I believe, I forget the exact year, but it's in the 30s, 1930s. That was the defining moment of an already splintered uh, group of where do we get power from or who do we trust officially splitting. And uh, that led to the diocese and prelacy. That's why it's confusing to hear uh, the different Armenian apostolic churches. So there's two bishops in New York City. One is the prelacy bishop in on 27th Street, and then there's a diocese bishop on um, 34th Street. Not to be confused with our church, which is also on 34th Street. A majority of Armenians are, are connected to the diocese and Echmiadzin numerically. Uh, the prelacy is really tied to the political party of the a, um, of the Tashnak group. Uh, it's, and this split is nothing theological at all. The Badrak is the same. It's just who's in who's in power. And the liturgy is nothing theological. It's just political allegiance, pretty much. Um, I'm not an expert on the details of it, but it's just important to know why there's two bishops um, in the Armenian East Coast and why there are two Katholikos. The only time I've seen the Katholikos together was the 100th anniversary of the genocide. Um, I'm sure they met other times, but, but that was at least one time to, to bring them together. So... You have diocese Armenians, you have prelacy Armenians, you have Catholic Armenians, and you have a whole plethora of Protestant Armenians. Majority of Armenians are apostolic. Majority of them are part of the diocese and connected to Echmiat Zin. Um, and we are scattered all over the world. We're one of the few countries that have more Armenians outside the country than in the country. Um, and we, are, we kind of build churches, we create business wherever we end up. Um, and uh, we were able to survive this complete decimation here. Um, and we're still kicking and still learning our history, uh, our church history, um, uh, 1,700 plus years later. So with that said, some book recommendations. Um, Highlights of Armenian Christendom uh, by Reverend Tutikian from our, uh, our, our Armenian evangelical world. 
Uh, he wrote a good outline of Armenian church history. Um, it's a good like spark notes highlights of of the entire um, Armenian church narrative. You could probably pick this up at the AMA. Um, it's a good it's a good read. Uh, Pastor Nishan translated it from Armenian. Um, many of you know Bajuli Nishan. So if you want to pick up more, read about some of the stuff we talked about, I, I picked that up as a good overall outline. If you want to know more about like the genocide and American international relief and missionaries and stuff, uh, you can read The Burning Tigers by Peter Balakian. Uh, he's a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he, he has ability to write really well. Um, and then another great book is by Eric Bogosian, the actor, actually. And this is about the assassination um, uh, attempt, uh, successful assassination of uh, Tat Pasha, who, who was the mastermind behind the genocide. And you have an Armenian evangelical killing, <laughs> killing uh, this, this, this evil uh, uh, person. And it's a really phenomenal, interesting read. Um, at the end of the book, he does a better uh, um, retelling of why there's the prelacy, why there's the diocese. He goes into all, all those po politics and he actually does it in a really entertaining manner. I was hoping to reread it before this lecture where I just didn't have the chance to find the book. Um, but it's a great book. It talks about how this young Armenian guy is able to kill uh, a former Turkish leader in Germany uh, and then be, being found not guilty. Really fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, and the guy is buried in Fresno, California and like lives a happy life after he's successful on his mission. I'm not saying we should be pro-murder, but it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating read nonetheless. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, with that said, uh, let's close this lecture online and, and go to uh, Q&A and discussion. If anyone wants to correct anything I said, I'm open to that. Again, I, I don't claim to be an expert. I'm an armchair Armenian historian. All right.